This week on PA Books, Edward Duffy, the author of Philadelphia, A Railroad History. Edward Duffy, author of Philadelphia, A Railroad History. Is there something special about Philadelphia as a railroad town as opposed to other cities? Yes, it is, and it gets to the reason why I wrote the book. Um, back in uh, 1998, uh, Conrail was acquired by Norfolk Southern and CSX. And at the time, the thought occurred to me that uh, Philadelphia was about to lose an institution which had been around here since uh, the 1840s. And um, an institution that had employed perhaps over 150 years, hundreds of thousands of people, and uh, had a really big impact on how the city had developed, both in terms of its uh, industrial development with a Baldwin locomotive and uh, also the city's actual physical form. Um, the, the, you're, everyone's familiar with Reading Terminal Market and 30th Street Station, Suburban Station, but not too many people might know the uh, role that the Pennsylvania Railroad played in you know, the design of the uh, Benjamin Franklin Parkway. Uh, that the, the parkway, which cuts across the city at a diagonal, really came up in discussions that were underway uh, with the Pennsylvania Railroad and b and Railroad and the Reading Railroad having to do with uh, some grade crossing improvements up around uh, Spring Garden Street and the uh, Philadelphia Art Museum and uh, the Waterworks. So with that in mind, uh, I thought before I lost it, I would sit down and, and write this book, and, and that's what I've done. Have you been a railroad buff? Um, my background in this is not in railroads. Uh, I had just recently gotten out of the Army in 1973, and I was looking for a, a real job. And so uh, I got a job working for the city economist, which was in the Philadelphia Commerce Department. And a couple weeks after I got the job, uh, the Congress passed the Regional Rail Reorganization Act. Now, in 1973, the railroads in Philadelphia, with the exception of the B&O, or what we now call CSX, uh, the, uh, the Pennsylvania Railroad and, and Reading Railroad were in bankruptcy. And so uh, the federal government um, activated this regional rail reorganization process, and they wanted the city of Philadelphia to respond to various plans that were coming out. Uh, R Mayor Rizzo received uh, the invitation to, to respond to these uh, plans. Uh, he delegated the city economist, and the city economist named me as the person who did the research. So um, I found myself uh, uh, learning all about this on the fly, and uh, uh, various city agencies, such as in those days, the, uh, the Philadelphia Port Corporation put up funds to, for us to uh, hire a consultant who would explain the whole thing to us. And so um, through 1973 to 1976, I was very much the city's point person on the freight side of this. Uh, I di really didn't get involved at all on the passenger side of it. And so then I went on to other things in real estate, but uh, uh, people have always come around. They've always remembered me as the railroad guy, so I, have to, I get a phone call. Would you please tell me how, how this came about? I, I was answering an email this morning from somebody wanting to know how the East Side Railroad of the B&O came into being. So, I mean, it follows me around. <laughs> so when you were going through the, the organization of Conrail and Amtrak, what, what kind of decisions did the city have to make? Well, um, the question, the, the sort of a, a dual uh, ideas that came up were, is there going to be one big railroad or, or are we going to take these various other railroads and divide them up? And if, in fact, we go with either of these two alternatives, are there lots of lines running all through Philadelphia? And well, at the state level, it was a very, very big issue with Governor Schaap, uh, hundreds, perhaps thousands of miles of track which really didn't make any money for the railroads. And in those days, th the industry was very tightly regulated by the Interstate Commerce Commission, who would tell the railroads, you must keep that line open, and even though they were losing money on it. So um, the, the city had to determine how to respond to any uh, uh, identifications of lines in Philadelphia as uh, to be abandoned. And in fact, m the first slide that I have here um, uh, I show uh, C Philadelphia City Planning Commission map of Philadelphia from 1971, which is kind of like the calm before the storm, because you'll see on that, on that map lines that no longer exist. Um, for example, there are two uh, parallel horizontal lines bracketing center city Philadelphia. Um, these were a uh, Pennsylvania Railroad line in the bed of Washington Avenue and a Reading Railroad line uh, roughly in the bed of Cal Hill Street, just, uh, just north of Cal Hill Street. Those lines were abandoned, uh, and there were other lines in Philadelphia abandoned, and throughout the state of Pennsylvania, there were, uh, I'm sure people who are watching this program can relate to uh, you know, the, the loss of railroad lines in the coal country. 
And this was just freight that you were looking at? Had Amtrak already been spun off? Um, Amtrak uh, had come into existence in 1971. Uh, legislatively, they were then empowered to create a Northeast Corridor Improvement Plan, um, uh, tell the federal government how much money is needed to create high-speed rail in, in uh, the Northeast Corridor. And uh, that was in 1971. Now, the enabling legislation for the Regional Railroad Organization Act continued that process. And then when Conrail came into uh, uh, existence in 1976, um, then $2 billion were provided at that time to Amtrak to rebuild the Northeast Corridor. And, and that, by the way, had a big impact on Philadelphia freight because um, Amtrak uh, very much wanted to eliminate um, freight interference on passenger lines because if they're now trying to get their trains like the Metro Liner, which came into existence around 1968, they're trying to get those trains up to 150 miles an hour. Uh, they, they don't want a, a switch engine with three boxcars, you know, crossing, crossing over the corridor. Uh, this leads me to a, a kind of a, a funny story. Uh, the city was planning the uh, airport high-speed line, uh, which would run from 30th Street Station to the airport. Well, it just so happens that the 30th Street Station and the airport are on opposite sides of the Northeast Corridor. So when the planning for this began, like in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, um, Amtrak was not in existence. And the city engineers were talking to um, Pennsylvania Railroad, Penn Central engineers, and what they proposed to do was to do a series of interlocks, which would take the airport high-speed train across at grade of the Northeast Corridor. And so the, uh, when Amtrak came along and they looked at these plans, they said, no, 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 you can't do that. Uh, you're going to have to design a flyover bridge, which would take the trains up, over, and, and down. And um, uh, Mayor Rizzo was just flabbergasted at this because he was counting on getting that line up and running in time for the bicentennial. So um, I recall uh, the city's transportation coordinator had gone down to Washington, and this is like 1974, and, he, and he, he got the message. And he comes back, and there's like 18 of us sitting around at that meeting table when he delivers the message. And he said, uh, the, I know we, we cannot do it the way we wanted to do. We have to build a bridge. But we're going to build that bridge, and we're going to have this line open in time for the 1976 bicentennial. And we're all like, <gasps> like this. And then he said, he said, and if anybody in this room doesn't believe we can get it done, you can just get up and leave. And everybody got up and left. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was, so I mean, this, this is how, you know, the, the railroad system was very much in flux at the time. And w w people were being dealt surprises right and left as this whole uh, process went, went, went forward. Did that line ever get built? The airport high-speed line? Absolutely, mm -hmm. and it opened like around 1986, like 10 years uh, late for the bicentennial. And it's a, it's a great line. I mean, uh, uh, I can go from my home in Mount Airy uh, to Ireland where my parents li used to live, and uh, I'm not in an automobile at all, ever, because I get on the train in Philadelphia, in my neighborhood, I get off at 30th Street, get on the airport high-speed line, I'm at the airport, I fly to Dublin, and my family's waiting for me. Okay. Well, your book on uh, Philadelphia railroad history, when can you point to a moment when railroad history starts in Philadelphia? Yes, uh, that's a good, good question. Um, really, you can take it all the way back to the time of George Washington, because Washington, who was uh, an engineer, a surveyor, an architect, was very much interested in seeing um, transportation linkages between centers of population and centers of raw materials. And in, in his day, that uh, connection would have been with canals. And so he was really pressing for canals. And here in Philadelphia, uh, Robert Morris, who was the financier of the Revolutionary War, um, he started up a group looking at various canals. Uh, one of them was proposed here for Philadelphia called the uh, Delaware and Schuylkill Canal Company. And uh, he funded it. And then another group said, well, let's take it up the Schuylkill River. So they took it up to Reading and, and points north of there over time. Um, however, uh, the Pennsylvania canals didn't work out so well. They didn't have enough funding. Robert Morris ended up in debtor's prison. And so things didn't go so well here in Philadelphia. But in the state of New York, things went really, really well. With the Erie Canal, uh, begun in 1818 and completed in 1825, linking the Hudson River at Albany with the Erie Canal at uh, Buffalo. And up until that point, um, Philadelphia had been the leading port and financial center of the United States. 
but in a very short period of time, uh, the Port of New York ate Philadelphia's lunch. So it was the Erie Canal that did that? Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And so um, alarmed Philadelphians who saw their, their business just disappearing uh, went to the state of Pennsylvania and said, can you come up with some alternative? And that's the state said, yes, we will, we will help you out. We'll, we'll build something that's an alternative to this Erie Canal. And that was called the main line of public works. Um, you hear about the main line mm -hmm. running Philly to, to Harrisburg. Well, that line uh, started out as a series of railroads and canals, and it was a four-day trip from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh. Uh, you started out in Philadelphia uh, on a railroad line that ran to uh, Columbia, Pennsylvania on the Susquehanna River at like 80 miles, and then you got on to uh, a, ca a canal boat that took you from, Hol from uh, Columbia to Hollidaysburg, and then there was a portage railroad that took you over the mountains into uh, Johnstown, and then you're back on a I think you're back on a canal then from, from uh, Johnstown to, uh, to Pittsburgh. It was, it was a horrible ride. I mean, now, four days going that way, how long did it take on the Erie Canal? Well, um, it, it took, uh, the Erie Canal was shorter and, and, it, and it was a one seat ride, if you will. I mean, you, you got on there and, and you went. So they could do it in about two days. They didn't have the mountains. Uh, right. They did, they did exactly. They <laughs> did not have the mountains. They did not have to contend with that. However, um, canals always have to deal with weather. Uh, it's freezing or you're having a, uh, a drought and so that 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 created problems for them but uh, when Pennsylvania began its its uh, arrangement the state of New York was already laying railroad track along the, the bank of the Erie Canal so I mean they were one step ahead and Philadelphia was not so uh, the uh, the main line of public works uh, limped along for maybe about 10 years and then uh, a new threat occurred for the Port of Philadelphia. Uh, the B&O Railroad uh, out of Baltimore, this is Baltimore, Ohio, um, they were going up the Potomac River, they were heading uh, in a uh, westerly, northwesterly direction to, to until they reached a point right next to the boundary of Pennsylvania. And they said, we're so, we're so close to Pittsburgh, let's, let's extend a line into Pittsburgh. Well, they had to get uh, state legislative approval for they that. They did? Why was they that? Hmm? Why was that, that they needed the state Legislature well, that it, it has been. It had been the law that t to build uh, a turnpike or a canal or something like that, a transportation amenity, um, one had to get authorization from the state legislature. So um, the B and O went to the state legislature, and there was a very tumultuous meeting where the Philadelphians opposed this uh, dramatically, and and the B and O lost this by one vote, and and that one vote rankled them for a hundred years, and it it had its repercussions. As, as recently as the 1950s, but um, the, the state people said, well, you don't like this main line of public works. Uh, what do you want? And so the uh, Philadelphians said, we're going to create our own railroad, and that's going to be the Pennsylvania Railroad, okay? So Philadelphians uh, got a charter for this. Uh, the, the main line still existed, and the main line was still hauling freight, but again, this, this mixed system of canals and railroads. And uh, over a 10-year period from 1847 to 1857, um, the uh, Pennsylvania Railroad uh, filled in the blanks, if you will, where the canal had been. They now put in a railroad track. And so by 1857, the, the Pennsylvania Railroad from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh was, was completed. Um, and now in Philadelphia, um, there was a uh, uh, main line of public works connection to the Schuylkill River. And th this shows uh, the Belmont Inclined Plain. When uh, this railroad system first started, um, one had to ascend this plateau uh, of seven degrees, and that was way, way too, too, too steep a grade for locomotives of 1835. So they put in an endless rope or conveyor belt with a stationary steam engine at the top of the hill, and they would take the cars that came down and they would attach them to this endless rope and drag them at the 7% grade right up to the top of Belmont Plateau. Well, this was horrible. I mean, it, it scared everyone out of their minds. And I, I you have I, some descriptions in there about how harrowing it was. Yes, uh, yes. A, yeah. a woman writing in 1836 said that some of the passengers didn't want to continue the ride once they got up to the top of the plateau. But um, when the Pennsylvania Railroad now, in this 10-year period, 1847 to 1857, when they're looking at their system and what are they going to do, uh, they said, well, uh, we're going to put in a level grade line, and that's going to take us to Market Street. And so um, that r roughly at 30th Street Station. So that's really how 30th Street Station became an important point on, on the railroad. Now, uh, an interesting uh, development occurred in the 1840s in Philadelphia. Uh, 
Uh, and actually, it began er even earlier in the 1830s. Uh, Philadelphians were a pretty wild and crazy group of people. Uh, they didn't hesitate to let people know their opinions of things. And uh, one of the things they really didn't like was Catholic immigrants. Okay, so in in the 1840s uh, there were riots in Philadelphia, uh, in which uh, um, Catholic churches were burned, convents and libraries were, were burned, and the uh, uh, local police were too uh, just too few to combat this. Uh, the second riot, which occurred in South Philadelphia and Southwark, required 5,000 state militia to uh, put down the rioting. So. Um, in those days, Philadelphia was much smaller than it is today. It was just this uh, area of about two square miles from Vine Street down to South Street and between the two rivers. And uh, that was the city, and then the rest of it was Philadelphia County. Well, uh, in, in 1854, uh, the decision was made. We have to merge the, the city government with the county government. Well, this had a big impact on the railroads because with the Pennsylvania Railroad coming to 30th and Market Streets, the stations on this, the passenger stations, the freight stations, were in center city Philadelphia. And they, to get to those stations, the city of Philadelphia would not allow uh, locomotives on city streets. Uh, the fear was that the uh, a ash and, and so forth flying up out of the fireboxes on the locomotive would set fire to people's homes. So uh, the city then created its own municipal railroad, which was horse-drawn. And so there was a horse-drawn railroad on Broad Street, and there was a horse-drawn railroad on Market Street. And uh, the, uh, uh, the, the railroads would have to turn over their cars to, to this horse drawn railroad. And in, in the 1850s, this railroad was running 24-7. And it still couldn't keep up with all the business because you know, the United States was growing very rapidly. So um, the slide that you'll see shows a, 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 what appears to be a hotel with garages in its basement and, and cars being pulled by horses going in and out of this garage. Well, that's how the railroad system worked. So uh, then, uh, with this merger of the city government and the county government, um, the City Hall of Philadelphia, which used to be uh, right next to Independence Hall on, on Chestnut Street, uh, proved to be much too small for, uh, for the new responsibilities that, that it now had to face. So um, the decision was made to build a new city hall. Uh, they put it to the voters. That there, there were five squares in Philadelphia. And they said, Where do you, which square do you want to put the, the uh, uh, City Hall on? And uh, the voters said, we want to put it on Center Square. Well, Center Square was the interchange yard for the Market Street and uh, a Broad Street had freight system. So uh, now some other alternative had to be found. Uh, fortunately for uh, the city and for the Pennsylvania Railroad, the president at the time was a man named J. Edgar Thompson, who was a real genius at, at this kind of thing. And he came up with two ideas which were called the Connecting Railroad and uh, the Junction Railroad. And the Connecting Railroad allowed uh, trains to go from the Schuylkill River arcing across uh, North Philadelphia to Frankfurt Junction. And then this Junction Railroad would take the, the traffic down from the Schuylkill River to South Philadelphia. So that system worked very well and it eliminated the need for the center square yard. So every, everything worked out that way. Which, which leads me to talk about another railroad in Philadelphia, which is uh, one of my favorites because so much of it remains, uh, but nobody knows it. Um, going south from Philadelphia to Wilmington to Baltimore, um, a group of Philadelphians in the 1830s came up with an idea of, of building this, this railroad system. However, uh, they wanted to avoid this horse drawn railroad. So instead, they, ju they just went outside of what was then the city of Philadelphia, that brought in Washington Avenue and they built a, a passenger train and freight station there. And then the line went uh, west and across the Schuylkill River and then turned south and went down to Baltimore, and uh, to Wilmington, and then from Wilmington to Baltimore. Um, it, it was able to cross the Schuylkill River on a bridge. Uh, it was the, the, the first bridge in South Philadelphia across the uh, Schuylkill River. And um, the gentleman who was the president of this company was named Matthew Newkirk. And so it became known as the uh, Newkirk Viaduct. And when this railroad was finally completed on uh, Christmas Day, 1838, um, people were so happy with it that they erected a monument uh, at 49th and Grays. On this monument, uh, they put the names of the engineers and, 
and the builders who, who had constructed all this. And, and if, if you go down to 49th and Grace today, you'll see it. It's still there. It's still there. It's covered with graffiti and, and trash and junk. It's right in the middle of real high-speed railroad lines. Uh, um, Amtrak goes flying through, SEPTA goes flying through. And so when I saw that, I was appalled. I was really appalled. And I said, you know, this is no way to treat such a, a wonderful uh, amenity, uh, uh, memento of Philadelphia's great Golden Railroad Age. So um, I say in the book that it should be taken to, uh, uh, clean, cleaned up, taken to 30th Street Station. I've since found out after writing the book that other people have had a similar idea. Uh, what they uh, are proposing to do is take it from its present location and they're going to move it maybe 200 yards to Bartram's Garden. And there they're going to clean it up and, and have people you know, available for people to, to see it. Pardon me. You, you mentioned a couple of um, the railroad stations that were in Philadelphia yeah. at the time, 30th Street. And, and you have a, a picture of 31st Street Station yes. in here. Can you talk about some of the great railroad stations that were in yes, Philadelphia? Yes, I, I would love to. Which one would you desperately have wanted to see? Okay. Um, the, the station that... Uh, the, this line I was just recently talking about, the Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Washington line, mm. uh, build a passenger station and a freight station uh, at uh, Broad and Washington. The freight station still exists. It has no historic marker on it. You would never know what, what its role had been. It was built in the 1850s. Uh, the role that it played in the Civil War is just, just phenomenal. And, and yet Philadelphians treat this, this, this building like it's, like it's a garage. <laughs> Pardon me. Um, with, when you go to Baltimore, um, the, the uh, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Washington Railroad Station in Baltimore is magnificently maintained, and uh, it is used by Baltimore as a Civil War museum. And, and the, the effect, uh, what had happened in the Civil War was that uh, uh, when the South Carolina militia attacked Fort Sumter in South Carolina, uh, the uh, uh, President uh, Lincoln um, asked each state to provide 5,000 troops. And Pennsylvanians were very happy to, to oblige. So um, a, a unit of this Pennsylvania militia was traveling to Baltimore, for, heading for Point South. And uh, they were attacked on the streets of Baltimore because Baltimore, just like Philadelphia, said, we don't want to have any locomotives on our streets. So rather than um, ride any other conveyance, the troops got off the train, the, Pen the Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Washington train at President Street, and they walked down Pratt Street to get aboard the B&O train at uh, Camden, Camden, Camden Yards, that's mm -hmm. where it was, Camden Station. And as the Philadelphians were walking down the street, they were attacked by a mob of secessionists in Baltimore, and a Philadelphian was murdered. And it, it was Philadelphia's first, <coughs> first uh, casualty of the Civil War, a man, a man named George Leisenring, who was a German immigrant and lived in Fishtown. So that, to me, uh, I think Philadelphians should pay a lot of attention to that particular station. Um, the Pennsylvania Railroad also built a beautiful station um, called Centennial Station, um, which, uh, getting back to the 1876 event, um, that station lasted uh, through that period. Uh, and then, um, in 1881, the Pennsylvania Railroad built Broad Street Station, which I actually remember because uh, my father had a, a studio uh, and I used to go down to his studio in the summer months when I was out of school. What kind of and studio? Uh, he, he restored works of art. And so um, I would like go up in the loft and I would look out the window, and this is like 1952, and uh, the station was under demolition. And I, 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 I remember just sitting in awe watching the, the, the iron ball swing and the building fall down. So that, that is a station that I remember well. Why did they knock it down? Well, um, the... Uh, the station was a nightmare from, from an operating perspective because um, th the main trains running north-south were operated on the west bank of the school, but now this Broad Street Station was in Center City right next to City Hall, and so the trains would have to back into the station, back out again, and it would add like anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes onto the schedule of the train running from Washington to New York. Well, that's, that was really the impetus to build um, 30th Street Station. Um, 30th Street Station uh, was conceived in the, the early 1920s, and it was encouraged by the fact that Philadelphia was having uh, this Ben Franklin Parkway constructed. And initially, uh, uh, the, the uh, city was very happy to see this, uh, this move out to 30th Street, where that old station had been in 1864. 
However, then the railroad said, well, the, if we're going to make this move, you're going to have to pay for some of the public improvements for this. And so the city of Philadelphia found itself on the hook for uh, like subway improvements and, and other, other improvements there. Then, of course, the, the, the station was completed around, I shouldn't say completed, it was well underway around 1930. The suburban station, by the way, was completed in 1930. But, uh, but then the Depression occurred, and uh, the city didn't have the money to, to, to pay its end of the bargain here. And uh, then World War II came along, you couldn't get the steel for the job. So 30th Street Station was actually completed uh, around 1954, 1952. And so uh, then it was okay to knock down the uh, uh, Broad Street Station. Can you talk about the uh, Chinese Wall? Yes, yes, because the Chinese Wall was how the trains got from the uh, uh, East Bank. They crossed the river, the Schuylkill River, now they're on the East Bank, and, and they continued right into uh, uh, Broad Street Station. Um, it was a real uh, blight on, on the city at, at, at that time. Uh, people who lived uh, in the vicinity of Logan Square didn't want to go south. People who lived in Rittenhouse Square didn't want to go north. Um, I uh, talk in the book about uh, a senator at the time, uh, George Wharton Pepper, who grew up, uh, uh, he lived in the, into his 90s and he wrote his autobiography, Philadelphia Lawyer, fascinating book. And uh, he uh, talked about how pleasant the city was around Rittenhouse Square, but how people didn't want to go north because of this Chinese wall. So the, the parkway really, uh, the, the combination of the parkway and uh, the 30th Street Station really addressed this, this blight. And once the, uh, there was no longer need for those two entities, uh, then they could be demolished and, and now you had uh, Penn Square and all the, all the developments that occurred in the 1950s and 1960s, which were office type developments. You also say in your book that people don't realize that there were once two Broad Street stations yeah. and one of them still exists. Oh yes, yes, that's right. Um, the uh, Reading Railroad uh, in the late 1920s was by that time owned by the B&O Railroad. And the B&O Railroad had service coming up through Philadelphia onto New York. And I've, I've ridden that, I remember uh, uh, being on that train, that service was eventually disconnected, discontinued in uh, 1958. But um, when the uh, Pennsylvania Railroad announced that they were going to build 30th Street Station, the B&O, again, as the owner of the Reading, decided that it would be a, a good idea for them to build a new station, and that was going to be uh, North Broad Street Station, which is up around Broad and Huntington, uh, Broad and Lehigh. And so they uh, uh, built this station in 1930. Their timing couldn't have been worse with the Depression. And then they decided that they, they were not going to use that station. So after having built it, it, it just sort of died on the vine for uh, 30 years, and then uh, the Reading eventually sold it, and, uh, um, and now it's uh, a halfway house for prisoners. Was, it, was that the same as North Philadelphia Station? No, North Philadelphia Station was different. Uh, North Philadelphia Station, which is just a little bit further north on Broad Street, uh, provided a really good connection for uh, fast passenger trains that didn't want to cross over into Broad Street Station. I mean, if, if the Pennsylvania Railroad was advertising a train like the American, okay, uh, worthy of the name it bears, uh, or the Broadway Limited, trains like that, they really didn't want to give up 30 minutes doing the uh, back and forth on the Schuylkill River. So they told Philadelphians, uh, uh, here's this real high-speed Philadelphia train to New York or Washington, but you're going to have to take the Broad Street subway or, or a cab or whatever to go up to uh, uh, North, Broad Street sta or North Philadelphia Station. Well, you talked about in this, the time before the Civil War how they, the soldiers took the train to one station and then had to walk yes. across town to another. Was that common? I mean, if you're going intercity training, uh, would you, and had to change railroads, you had to find your way across Absolutely. town to the next that, railroad? That's how it was for many years, uh, not only Philadelphia and Baltimore, but Wilmington as well. Uh, it, was, uh, it was just how things were. And uh, one more...